Miners say no to a pay strike against their leader's advice. But their president, Arthur Scargill, insists there's a hit list of pits. The coal board deny it. The CBI's director general says firms should consider no pay rise at all. And the new television channel is on the air, launched an hour ago. The miners have, as expected, decisively rejected strike action over their pay claim. The figures announced this morning show a 61% no vote in last week's pithead ballot, which linked action over pay with opposition to pit closures. The result was announced at the National Union of Mine Workers London headquarters by the union president, Mr Arthur Scargill, who appeared in defiant mood. Well, contrary to popular belief, it is not a chastened Arthur Scargill who is conducting this press conference. It's a very confident Arthur Scargill who is conducting the press conference reiterating that the campaign that we conducted was absolutely correct and reaffirming that the policy of this union determined by the conference has been substantiated by something that I will relate to you a little later on in the proceedings. And that turned out to be a coal board document apparently prepared for the Monopolies Commission listing 75 short life pits which Mr Scargill said the board plans to close. I'm convinced that in the light of the evidence that we've now received which demonstrates that the coal board have a secret document which they intend uh, to put to the Monopolist Commission or have put to the Mon Monopolist Commission, which cites the short life collieries, 75 in various parts of Britain, which are itemized. It shows that there's some duplicity on their part and that they have not been telling the truth to this union. In the light of this, the executive today have decided to ask for an immediate meeting on this issue and demand an explanation. And our parliamentary representatives are also equally appalled. It's a united executive this morning. Our campaign was right, our policy was right, and our membership, I think, in the future will demonstrate their support for us. Is it genuine? Oh, yes. There are, there are three documents, actually. There's part of one, which was one of our submissions to the MMC, and uh, the other two are purely internal statistical documents. So, should they all be read together? Uh, no, I don't think they're connected at all. Now, what about this figure of 75 short-life pits? I mean, are there 75 pits which have got a, a limited life, and how long is that life? Well, all pits have got a limited life, of course, but those 75... I mean, this is a snapshot taken at any point in time, and uh, short life in this context means 10 years. But that depends entirely on whether we invest money in them, whether we find other seams, whether we get new techniques which will enable them to be worked longer and so on. Well, the speculation had been how Arthur Scargill would weather what was seen as a crushing defeat. Nearly two-thirds of miners who voted voted against taking industrial action over pay and pit closures. Well, he's done so by producing what the coal board chairman calls a rabbit out of the hat in the shape of these documents. The coal board has counted vigorously, insisting that the 75 short-life pits have a life of up to 10 years and longer if investment has been put in. Well, the effect has been to worry some members of the miners' executive, particularly those in the northeast. But it remains to be seen how much effect it will actually have after such a clear and decisive vote. The South Wales Britannia colliery at Pengham near Caerphilly is expected to be exhausted in about a year's time. But the unions say there are still reserves of coal to be dug and they'll fight any closure attempt. Why did the men there think so many miners voted against action on pay and closures? Primarily because, A, they knew, didn't think they'd have more wages than what they would have, would have so they voted on the wages issue. On a pit closure, I think the ballot would be quite reverse. What, what do you think? Well, I think the same as Tom. I'm very, I'm very disappointed in the ballot throughout the country. I was hoping we'd have a majority, a vast majority for a yes vote. I, uh, I, I voted yes for the ballot because uh, I think we are, we are playing into Margaret Thatcher's hands then. That, that they, you know, owing to the loss of, of job, job losses now, the, uh, the amount of people who are unemployed, it is going to get worse. In the long-running hospital workers' pay dispute, there were signs tonight of some movement. Leaders of the National of the Health Service Unions have accepted an invitation by the Conciliation Service, ACAS, for talks which are to begin in under half an hour. The new move comes amid reports of a fresh initiative to end the dispute, although in Whitehall it's been stressed that no fresh money is available. 
There's speculation that although the government won't improve on this year's offer of between 6 and 7.5%, and they may be prepared next year to increase their 4% offer by another 1%. Union leaders arriving for the meeting at the TUC said the discussions were at an exploratory stage, just talks about talks. As yet, they said, they'd received no word from the government. Today's meeting at the TUC followed a preliminary visit last night by union leaders to the offices of ACAS. Following the arguments over public sector pay, there's now a suggestion that employers in the private sector should think about giving their workers no rises at all. It's come from the CBI's Director General, Sir Terence Beckett, in his closing address to their conference in Eastbourne. But he repeated demands that the government should help create jobs by abolishing the national insurance surcharge. Reporting from the conference, James Long. Sir Terence Beckett used the final session to repeat the CBI's plea to the government to cut the national insurance surcharge, the so-called jobs tax paid by companies for every person they employ. CBI leaders believe Sir Geoffrey Howe has taken note and a cut in the surcharge could even be announced by the Chancellor later this month. On pay, Sir Terence gave his backing to the government campaign for much lower settlements this time round. We've got to get the message down on the line on pay and once and for all remove the illusion that the Emperor's clothes can be woven out of fresh air. Zero general wage settlements should be seriously considered now that inflation is coming down to 5% and lower. To provide more jobs, we have in some cases to price people back into work. Austerity is philanthropy in Britain today. What we did with pay in the 70s, you know, did nobody any favours. Businessmen meeting here have been more careful than in past years not to rock the boat with the government too much. Though there are still few signs of recovery from recession, they're hoping the government is starting to see things more their way. With a further cut in interest rates coming soon, they believe that help is round the corner. In any case, with an election possibly looming, many of the leaders of industry here have been keen to minimise their differences with a government that they prefer to the alternatives. The Cabinet today agreed the government's spending plans, totalling £121 billion for the next financial year. But our political correspondent says there is no indication of when and if any statement is to be made providing more help for industry. 900 more jobs are being lost in the steel and motor industries. British Steel is to lose 600 from its plant at Corby because of a severe drop in orders. And the Land Rover company, based in Birmingham, is to shed 300 in an efficiency drive. It says this can be achieved by voluntary redundancies and natural wastage. Republican prisoners at the Mays in Northern Ireland have ended their no-work campaign. The protest by 145 prisoners was for special status at the Mays. The Northern Ireland office said the men were now prepared to do normal prison work. The campaign reached a climax with the hunger strike last year in which 10 prisoners starved themselves to death. Three men carried out an armed attack at a post office in Newcastle. As they tried to get away, a second van drove up, blocking their path. But the men managed to escape after firing a shotgun at one of the vans and hitting one of the postmen on the head with a handgun. It's thought the gang got away with about £27,000. Their car was later found abandoned about a mile away. After the death of a woman whose naked body was found on railway tracks in Buckinghamshire at the weekend, an 18-year-old youth has been remanded in custody for a week, charged with murder. The murdered woman was Mrs Kathleen Hopkins. The youth charged Alan Pinkerton from Ivor. Channel 4 went on the air today. Britain's first new television channel for 18 years started with a quiz programme. Mike Sullivan was watching. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be able to say to you, welcome to Channel 4. Channel 4 launched in the teeth of a recession which has withered advertising revenue and the resistance of two strong trade unions to its lean, low-cost philosophies came to life an hour ago. First with an exotic series of pictures without commentary, a taste of its future programmes, then with a television word game as its very first programme. It's a nervous climax to a nervous run-up for the new channel. Its funding system is new. It's already up against unions accustomed to years of lucrative work with independent television, once described as a license to print money. And launch day optimism is tempered with wise caution. 
I don't think that I'd be so daft as to predict success. This is the storm before the storm here. Uh, and I don't really think there's going to be much of a honeymoon either. Yeah. But what, what I do think is that it's a fairly long haul. In the long run, I don't have any doubt at all that the channel will establish itself and be successful, yes. After defeat in the Falklands War, Argentina is resuming diplomatic attempts to gain sovereignty over the islands. It's tabled a resolution at the United Nations calling for the resumption of negotiations with Britain over the issue, something the British government insists would be a waste of time at the moment. From New York, Martin Bell. A lot of diplomatic manoeuvring backstage here. The British, led by a new ambassador, Sir John Thompson, are facing an innocuous looking resolution calling for a negotiated settlement of the Falklands dispute. They want to avoid a vote if they can. The Argentines, led here by their foreign minister, Juan Ramon Lanari, want one. Mr. Lanari spoke first. His difficulty was to try and dismiss the cardinal United Nations principle of self-determination. In this case, he said, it didn't apply. As far as the British subjects presently residing in the islands are concerned, they are merely instruments of colonial domination, agents of the occupier in the occupied territory. The British ambassador will be on his feet within a matter of minutes and according to the prepared text will ask for Argentina to extend a friendly hand to the islanders, not a menacing fist. The debate which will run for two and a half days is expected to be angry, bitter and polemical. The British attitude is we didn't ask for this fight but we're not running away from it either. However, it'll be difficult to turn back a resolution which in its essential paragraph simply asks for negotiations and a peaceful settlement to the sovereignty dispute. A great deal left out of it, though, who started the war, who laid the mines, who even now is refusing formally to accept an end to hostilities. None of that gets a mention. Unconfirmed reports say the frantic efforts to keep HMS Sheffield afloat after she'd been hit off the Falklands were because she was carrying nuclear-armed depth charges and time was needed to get them off. Our defence correspondent says the task force almost certainly carried nuclear weapons, not because there were plans to use them, but simply because there wasn't the opportunity to take them off ships like the Sheffield before they sailed. And launching day at Southampton for a new stretched version of a Type 42 destroyer. So stretched that the bow of HMS Gloucester stuck out of the covered berth and a special awning had to be built for the launch. My name is Mr. Gloucester. May God bless and all and then, firmly holding her husband's hand, the Duchess of Gloucester performed a perfect launch. When they were introduced into the Royal Navy, HMS Sheffield, lost in the Falklands, was the first. Type 42s cost £23 million. Eight years later, the bill for HMS Gloucester will be around £100 million, with annual running costs in the region of £10 million. A cartoon comparing Guy Fawkes Night with the Falklands War as a warning to children about the dangers of fireworks is not to be withdrawn, despite criticism that it's in bad taste. It indicates that the outcome in both cases can be the same, victims in hospital with severe burns. Defending it, the director of the British Safety Council says adults are growing complacent about the risks from fireworks. A week after the election of Spain's first socialist government for over 40 years, the Pope has called on all Spaniards to respect the result. On the third day of his visit, the Pope, with King Juan Carlos and Queen Sofia, went to Madrid's royal palace to meet military and political leaders. Including Prime Minister-elect Felipe González, whose party is committed to reforming the abortion laws and religious education. The Pope emphasised that his visit was preeminently religious, but he said he wanted to pay respect to the legitimate representatives of the Spanish people. In his speech, he said he hoped Spanish freedom would always be preserved. Then, from the balcony, he addressed the crowds below. The Princess of Wales is thoroughly enjoying married life. That's what she told residents of the Royal School for the Blind in Surrey. The princess, who was opening a new wing there, was chatting to residents packing spoons when one who's getting married soon asked her what it was like. Wonderful, so don't worry, the princess replied. 
Princess Diana also had a chance to practice Welsh when she met David Symes, a resident from Wales. She apologised for being behind schedule. <laughs> then it was on to business. The extension she was opening will house 60 residents and has cost nearly £2 million. Outside, a number of younger fans had gathered to meet the princess and she did not disappoint them. There's to be a new British attempt on the world water speed record on Lake Coniston, where Donald Campbell died nearly 16 years ago. The boat, British Pursuit, was unveiled in Manchester today with hopes it'll reach over 318 miles per hour. The man making the attempt is confident it's far safer than Campbell's boat. I've looked at that crash and I've looked at other drivers throughout the world that's died uh, for this particular record. And um, one thing this boat has got is probably, the, it is the most safest boat in the world. Meanwhile in America, preparations for a British attempt on the world land speed record. The car, Thrust 2, has arrived at the site of the attempt at the Black Rock Desert in Utah. It's hoped that Thrust 2, driven by Richard Noble from Twickenham and sponsored by nearly 200 British companies, will attempt the 622 mile per hour record sometime this week. The Football Association has confirmed that it will hold an inquiry into the crowd trouble which interrupted play at the Leeds Newcastle game last Saturday. They could order Leeds to close their Ellen Road ground if they found that the club failed to take reasonable precautions to prevent trouble. The club's already said that it's prepared to close some sections and to ban convicted hooligans. In the disturbances, Newcastle's Kevin Keegan was hit on the head by a marble and the referee suspended play for five minutes. Three policemen were also hit and more than 50 fans were arrested. The main points once again, the miners, as expected, voted decisively against a strike in spite of their leader's advice. Union President Arthur Scargill accused the coal board of despicable tactics over pit closure plans and insisted there was a hit list. The coal board deny it. The CBI's Director General has urged companies in the private sector to consider no pay rises at all now that inflation is falling. John Humphreys will be here at nine o'clock, but from me, that's all for the present.